Okay, we're going to talk now about abnormal fracture healing. And if you're watching this, hopefully you've already looked at an earlier lecture that went over the steps of normal fracture healing. So what can go wrong with fracture healing? The simplest thing that can go wrong is we end up with a bone that is too long, too short, or displaced medially, laterally, anteriorly, or posteriorly. These are actually fairly minor problems that are actually easy to tolerate and easy to, to um, adjust. Synostosis is what happens when parallel bones both fracture and fuse to each other. So, for example, here in the foot, these metatarsals have all fractured at the same level, and the callus formation that bridged the fractures also bridged between the different bones. A uh, common place for this to occur is in the forearm or leg. Here in the leg, we had fractures of the tibia and fibula, and these have healed with a synostosis between the two bones, and this can result in stiffness, especially in the ankle joint. Malunion uh, occurs when the fracture has healed with either an angular deformity or a rotational deformity, not with displacement, angular or rotation. So here's a patient with a distal tibial fracture. Part of their instrumentation has been removed already, but we can see that the fracture is healed with angulation uh, here in the varus direction, same with the fibula. Here's a patient whose proximal radius has healed also with angulation, and you can imagine in the forearm that this is going to block normal supination and pronation. A more subtle uh, fracture of the distal humerus that's also healed with angulation, resulting in a varus uh, elbow joint, and this shows us how we can correct these. So to correct an angular bone, it's like you heard in the old days, they had to re-break the bone and reset it, and that's exactly what a malunion repair is. We do an osteotomy, adjust it back to normal position, and then reset it, and, and hopefully it'll heal there. Now, malunion by itself usually won't correct itself, but there is one exception, and that is in young children, an angular malunion may correct itself. So here we have a distal radius fracture. It's uh, angulated in the cast. Here it is two months. It's healed out of the cast, still with the angulation. But as the child grows uh, here at eight months later, we can see that as they're growing, the bone is straightening out. That won't happen in adults. Now, one type of, of malunion that will never correct itself in, in children or adults is a rotational malunion. This may be harder to recognize unless you have two joints on each side of the fracture. So here we're looking at a lateral view of the knee, but an AP view of the ankle. Therefore, somewhere in here, there's a 90-degree twist of the, the tibia and fibula, and just the opposite in the other side. So that's a rotational malunion. And just like an angular malunion, this can be uh, fixed as well surgically. Another rotational malunion here. To fix this, we do an osteotomy of the tibia rotate it back to normal position, and then internally fix it with an intramedullary nail. Notice at the same time, we had to do a osteotomy of the fibula to allow it to rotate as well. Joint incongruence is a complication of, of fractures that are intra-articular, and this means a fracture that's healed without a nice smooth articular surface. And that can be due to a gap between the fracture fragments, a step off between the fracture fragments, or die punch depression. And the problem with all of these is that they can lead to premature osteoarthritis. So here's a CT examination of a distal radius that's healed, but with incongruence. Here we see a gap in the articular surface. Now that's not so bad because that can fill in with fibrous tissue. So it can still be smooth, even though there's no cartilage on top. A little bit more severe is a step off, like we can see here, which becomes rougher for the bone that's articulating with it. And then the worst is where we have actually die punch depression, like here, and the scaphoid can actually fall into the radius. And all these can lead to premature osteoarthritis. You can see we're already developing some joint space narrowing and subchondral cyst formation. Premature closure of the physis is a problem that can occur in, in children's fractures, and this is especially problematic in Salter-Harris 4 and 5 fractures, and it can result in a growth disturbance. So we, here we have a child who's had a distal radius fracture that's healed, but it's healed with this angulation of the distal articular surface. Why is that? It's because somewhere in here, we have premature fusion of the physis, and this is easiest to recognize on CT or MR. Here on MR, we can see that across the open physis, 
we actually have new bone formation that's occurred there. Delayed union means a fracture that's healing more slowly than we expect. Um, and if you watch the first part of this lecture, you know that fracture healing times are very variable. So this is both site and age specific. So here's a fracture of the tibia at three months. We still have a pretty big fracture gap. Boy, at five months, we still have that same fracture gap, yet we're still developing more callus formation. As long as on sequential films you see progression of callus formation, we don't have a non-union yet. It may be slow, but it can still heal. At six months, we can see that now the fracture is starting to close off. We held uh, the course, and then at 12 months, it went ahead and healed correctly. Non-union, though, is the granddaddy of, of abnormal fracture healing. And non-union occurs when healing has stopped before the fractures unite. So here we have a fracture of the radius and ulna at two months, internally fixated. We have a lot of callus formation, but still have a gap across that fracture. Here at nine months now, still have a gap across that fracture. At 12 months, the fracture gap has actually gotten bigger, and we notice that the fixation has itself fractured, which guarantees that the bone did not heal. And then at 15 months, we have absolutely no progression that's occurred from 12 to 15 months. Now that there's absolutely no progression, we know this is an established non-union. Just like when we look at uh, for acute fractures, we can't diagnose that just with a, a single view. Same is true for fracture healing. You might look at this tibia and fibula and say, well, that's a beautifully healed fibula, nice bridging bone, medullary space reestablished, and that looks like good callus formation for the tibia as well. But when you look at the lateral, the two parts of the tibia are in two different time zones here. There's the fibula healed, and there we have a non-union of the tibia, nothing bridging there at all. So you do need still an AP and lateral at the least to tell if a fracture is healed. And you may need even more. Because sometimes there's so much callus formation that two-dimensionally we can't tell, is there any bridging here or not? And that's where we go ahead and do CT. The CT of this examination, we can see that there's absolutely no bridging bone between any of these fracture fragments, and this was another non-union. Now, if you recall, normal fracture healing was a clinical diagnosis. Abnormal fracture healing non-union is both a clinical and radiologic diagnosis. Clinically, we're looking for motion at the fracture site, and sometimes we can see that radiographically. So here's a fracture of the scaphoid a, a couple of months out. On this projection, non-displaced, and then a second projection the very same day, we can see that the two fragments have moved. If the fragments are moving, that's motion. That's got to be a non-union. Clinically, we're also looking for is there continued pain or tenderness at the site and if there's a lost reduction. So the fracture was back in its normal position and now has become uh, displaced or angulated again. Eventually, if the bones don't heal, the metal will heal. All implants will heal by fatigue. And that's not because the metal was designed incorrectly. It's that because the bone has micromotion there. So here's a fracture of a phalanx internally fixated at three months. We can see a lost reduction, develop new angulation, and the plate has fractured. The screws holding the plate have fractured. Again, those weren't faulty screws or faulty plate. There was failure of bone healing, and that's your clue. We can treat a non-union with a non-union repair, which is basically going to be removal of the prior uh, fixation, removal of the new cortex that's formed along the bone ends, bone grafting within there, and then new internal fixation. And that's what a non-union repair is. So another non-union here, all the fixation has failed, not because it was faulty, but because the fracture itself did not heal. Now there's two types of non-union. The most common is called hypertrophic non-union. And this is basically a technical failure. Typically that there was too much motion at the fracture site, so a failure of, of fixation, or that the bone was infected or had a poor blood supply. And what we see in these patients is callus formation does occur, but it never bridges the two or more fracture fragments. So here in the tibia at two months, we see a lot of callus formation. We have bridging of the fibula, but no bridging across the tibia, still a persistent fracture gap. 
at six months, no progression at all. We still have that fracture gap. And we could confirm that with CT that absolutely no bone has grown from point A to point B. And this is a hypertrophic nonunion. These are the types that can form enough callus formation that on radiographs we may not recognize that there's no bridging bone and have to resort to CT. Here I couldn't tell on the radiographs, but clearly on the CT, there's no bridging between the two parts of the scaphoid. The bone ends themselves will become rounded over and smooth as new cortex forms along them. So here in this fracture uh, transfixed with an intramedullary nail, we can see that the bone edges are no longer trabeculae, sort of hanging in the breeze, trying to fuse, but rather we have rounded over bone ends. And the medullary space will be obliterated, assuming, of course, we don't have intramedullary fixation. So here's a fracture of the radius and ulna. The radius has healed. The ulna shows non-union. And on CT, we can see there's still a persistent fracture line. But notice that the normal marrow which contains this fat here, has been obliterated by this callus formation, which is blocking essentially the medullary space here. We may or may not form a pseudoarthrosis, with it, which is a new joint between the two uh, parts of the bone. So if we see a hypertrophic nonunion where the two bones conform to each other in sort of this curved fashion, we know they formed a new joint and are moving right at that site, a pseudoarthrosis. Now, all these non-unions can be treated, I said, with a non-union repair. Uh, again, we remove the new bone formation, re-bone graft it, and put new fixation in. And then we follow that and see if that will heal or not. The less common type of non-union is called atrophic non-union. And this is typically a biologic failure. There's something wrong with the body, and the body's just not making any callus formation. And that can be a, an underlying disease like diabetes, malnutrition, or that the area has been radiated or there's neuropathy, and it's characterized by no callus formation at all. So here's a fracture of the femur, developed non-union. This was a, um, sorry, a butterfly uh, fragment here that has healed to the distal fracture fragment, but absolutely no callus formation between the main fracture fragments here. Uh, a fracture of the scaphoid on CT examination, no callus is formed at all. Here's a patient with a femur fracture that developed an atrophic nonunion. Maybe there was one little spicule of callus formation. And like a hypertrophic nonunion, if the bone doesn't heal, guaranteed the metal, the fixation will fail as well. Now, you want to distinguish that from this. Here's another patient with a femur. Uh, the fracture, uh, there's a fracture here with a, a, a fractured nail, but in this case, tons of callus formation. In fact, this was a fracture that had perfectly healed, and the patient decided to get back on their motorcycle and was hit by another car. So this isn't a non-union, but rather just a re-fracture. What may happen is we may develop fibrous uh, material between the two fractured bone ends, so it's not necessarily going to be a mobile pseudoarthrosis, and we develop this very characteristic fine sclerotic line along the fractured bone ends. So here in atrophic nonunion of the clavicle, no callus formation, but these nice smooth edges with this thin little white line of bone, just like you can see here, this was a patient who had been previously radiated and developed a nonunion again. The fixation has to fail if this is a non-union. So you want to put all this together when you're describing your fractures, both normal and abnormal fracture healing. You want to be able to describe the callus formation, whether it's fluffy, immature, mature, bridging. Uh, and you may need to remove the caster splint to see that. Remember, if you have something that obscures bone detail, you're not going to get a good look at the callus formation. You want to be able to describe the fractured line and how much fracture gap is, uh, is there, whether that's a sharp line or indistinct, whether it's obliterated, whether it's widening. And then you want to put these two factors together and your knowledge of how fractures heal and come up with a final diagnosis. Is this a fracture that's healed? Is it healing? Is it malunion? Is it nonunion? Or is it you just can't tell? And that's sometimes what happens if you have just one film Nothing that came before, and at this point in time, all you can say is this particular fracture has not healed. I don't know if it's going to go ahead and heal or not. We're going to need sequential films. And really, for all of fracture healing, both normal and abnormal, sequential films are the key to making the correct diagnosis.